All right, this is Cardiac AMP. This is our review. review. We're starting a review for RT210 uh, for the final. I will be going through these sections uh, rather quickly. Uh, you do have the, the luxury to go back and look at the recording. Uh, when I get to a section of a student, if you have a question about any aspect of that section, be, feel free to ask. Uh, and we can go over that part. Cardiac AMP starts it off. <clears throat> Talk about the blood. The blood uh, has red blood cells and white blood cells. Uh, it consists of platelets and it's 90% water and 10% solutes. Uh, don't forget we have three types of fluid in the body. The blood makes up the intravascular fluid. What does it do? It transports respiratory gases circulates the defenses, gives nutrients to the cell, remove waste from the cell. It's responsible for clotting and electrolytes. Uh, the red blood cell count, we use the lowest in the female and the highest for the male. So it's about 4.2 to 6.2 million, okay? That's red blood cells. The white blood cells are five to 10,000 in both male and female. Don't forget your electrolytes. <clears throat> when you name your electrolytes, you have to know these by heart. Whenever you do name them, don't forget your uh, unit of measurement. This is milli equivalents per liter. Milli equivalents per liter. So for instance, potassium is 3.5 to 5 milli equivalents per liter. If you don't know the suffix, you will get that wrong in your orals. All right, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the carrier of oxygen. Remember we said oxygen is carried two ways, either dissolved in the plasma or combined to the hemoglobin, which is the most way that it's carried is the hemoglobin. Uh, it is different in male and females, but we do a rounded total of 12 to 15 grams for male and female. So the range for hemoglobin is 12 to 15 grams. This is just a picture here of showing you how oxygen is grabbed by the hemoglobin, carried by the hemoglobin, and released into the tissues. So the oxygen comes in from the lungs, it attaches to the hemoglobin molecules, then it bonds and it's carried through the bloodstream. And when it gets to the tissues, it releases the oxygen into the tissues. The heart, the heart's positioning, right? It's posterior to the sternum, superior to the diaphragm, and off to the left side, okay? The, layer, the heart has layers. It has a sac and it also has layers. The sac is called the pericardium. The pericardium is the sac that surrounds the heart and the heart itself has three layers. The exterior wall is epicardium, inner wall is endocardium and the heart muscle itself is the myocardium. We talked about the four chambers and the four valves of the heart. Make sure you go back over these. Uh, the chambers are the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. We also have valves of the heart. We have the tricuspid valve which is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The pulmonary valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Bicuspid or mitral valve is between the left atria and the left ventricle. And finally, the aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. <clears throat> After the blood gets to the aorta, it goes to the rest of the body. Don't forget that the right side of the heart is pulmonary circulation, deoxygenated blood from the body. And then the left side of the heart is the systemic circulation. This is highly oxygenated blood that leaves the heart to the body. <clears throat> we have two types of vessels in the heart. This would be one of your oral questions as well. Arteries are responsible for carrying blood away from the heart and veins carry blood to the heart, okay? Uh, usually arteries are always oxygenated except for the pulmonary artery and usually Veins are deoxygenated except for the pulmonary veins. The only exception. This is just another photo here of the circulation. 
Again, pathway of blood through the heart. It's very, very important. Here it is here. You guys did pretty well with naming the full through the heart. Make sure you practice that so that you're understanding uh, every moment because you might get a question on your oral that says, what is uh, the valve that's between the left atrium and the left ventricle? You have to know which valve that is. If you don't know the order, you'll be thrown off. Okay? I have a question. Yes. Does do we does we have to include pulmonary valve and all that in the pathway? Yes, pulmonary valve is one of your valves. Oh, okay, I don't remember it being like that long having all that stuff in there. Okay. Superior inferior vena cava to the right atria through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. Then you have the pulmonary capillaries or the lungs, right? That oxygenates it. And it comes back to the heart via the pulmonary vein into the left atria, through the mitral or bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle, through the aortic valve, through the aorta. Okay. All right, there also has a uh, stimulation of electricity that goes through the heart. Make sure you study that. Starts with the SA node, down to the AV node, bundle of hiss and then the left and right bundle branches from Kenji fibers and <clears throat> vagus nerve stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system can slow a heart rate. You know that now that you've had pharmacology, it slows the heart rate. Acetylcholine will make the heart rate go down. So we have to take a anticholinergic that will make it go back up, which is atropine in that case. This is a picture here of the positioning of those things we just named. Uh, you won't have a diagram per se, uh, but you will have to know these positions. All right, the layers that we talk about as far as um, cellular, we talked about electrical, physical layers of depolarization and repolarization. Uh, what happens, don't forget what happens on the cellular level, you have a cell that is rich with potassium right? And then a lot of sodium starts to come in that causes a depolarization or contraction. Depolarization, contraction, squeeze, and asystole are all the same thing, okay? When that sodium is pushed back out of the cell, you have repolarization or relaxation or diastole. Don't forget the parts of the EKG wave. P wave is for atrial contraction. QRS is the ventricle contraction and the T wave is the ventricle relaxation or repolarization. This is that picture here of the <clears throat> repolarization. You see how you have back to uh, potassium being in the cell only and the sodium is outside. Now we chill it, right? Everything is normal. We can relax, repolarize. This is an example of a normal sinus rhythm of your EKGs. Remember your EKGs are in your Egan's book. Make sure you go back over those EKGs, knowing um, what they look like, the different type of arrhythmias that we have. <clears throat> Not only just the four deadly, they may have a strip that comes up on your screen or uh, on your test, you have to tell me what EKG is that, okay? Oh, all right, the parts of the EKG, I just told you those. Uh, basic EKG waves, you have sinus rhythms. The sinus rhythms, remember, start with the SA node, right? They're normal. They go through their normal uh, uh, motions. They have all the parts. If it's sinus, it has all the parts. It can be sinus, a uh, normal sinus rhythm, which is 60 to 100. It can be sinus tachycardia, which is over 100, or sinus bradycardia. has all the parts, but it's not at least 60 beats per minute, right? You have your atrial rhythms, which you won't have too many questions on your atrial rhythms, but you need to know them. Uh, you have the PACs, which would be a premature atrial contraction. That would be a P wave that comes out of nowhere, right? Atrial flutter is the sawtooth. Atrial flutter is the one that looks like a sawtooth pattern. Real pretty, sharp, concise pattern. Atrial fibrillation, when the atria just twitching, right? They're just twitching. But the atrial rhythms are not life-threatening. 
right? They're not life threatening, okay? So it's kind of showing you again the P, Q, R, S, T, uh, what's happening at those points. During the P wave, you have your atrial are contracting, right? Then your QRS is your ventricles are contracting. And the T wave is when the ventricle relaxes. Okay? <clears throat> a fibrillation, it just has a chaotic twitching. Look at this right here. It's showing you this is kind of twitching around. It's twitching, twitching, twitching. Uh, this is not the sawtooth pattern. The sawtooth is more organized than this, but this is this will be atrial fibrillation. The atria just kind of just twitching. And flutter would be more defined. Boom, 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 QRS, boom, 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 QRS. And it looks just like the edge of your knife, right? Uh, one of your kitchen knives. That's atrial flutter. Flutter. Then we get into our ventricular rhythms, which are uh, the first one will be a PVC. When you have a QRS, this right here, out of nowhere, it doesn't follow a what? P wave. You should have a P QRST. P QRST. Now look, QRS came out of nowhere. That's a premature ventricular contraction, also known as a PVC. Not life threatening unless it's multi, uh, a bunch of them, right? And when it becomes too many of them together, it turns into ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. This is one of your deadly arrhythmias. You have no T wave, no P wave, nothing but the ventricle contracting, 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 right? That is VTAC, one of your deadly rhythms. V fib is definitely a deadly rhythm. If you see this, you must defibrillate the patient or shock the patient. This is just a uh, the, the, uh, now you have the ventricles just kind of twitching, right? They're just kind of twitching, the ventricles. Not enough to sustain a nice pump of blood through the body. <clears throat> V-fib is another one of your deadly rhythms, as well as asystole when you have no systole. A means without systole. Systole is depolarization, a.k.a. contraction, a.k.a. squeeze. You don't have that. So that's a deadly rhythm. And then finally, you have your EMD, electrical mechanical dissonance, also known or formerly known as PEA, which means pulseless electrical activity. It looks perfect. Looks like a normal sinus rhythm, but there is no pulse, right? No pulse. So if you're looking at your patient, he looks kind of funny, out, dead, and you see this right here, don't just walk away, oh, his heart rate is fine. No, go check his pulse, because it may be absent, and that's pulseless electrical activity. So the electricity is working, but the actual squeezing, depolarization, and repolarization is not happening. See, and so they use the same one for normal sinus rhythm. They look the same, but this one, he will have a pulse. All right, so this is what we just talked about here in words, if you want to go back and look at that. All right, diseases. We talked about some cardiovascular diseases. You got hypertension, which is a blood pressure above 120 over 80, MI for heart attack. Corpulmonal will be a right-sided heart failure. Uh, you can also have some congenital abnormalities that babies are born with, right? Sometimes babies are born with uh, congenital abnormalities. You have some vascular diseases, diseases of the actual vessels, like aneurysm. When the aneurysm is when your uh, blood vessels- Mr. McCarthy. Yes. Uh, congenital abnormalities. Could you give us an example? You'll have your examples when you get to 240. That's when you're gonna talk about peds. We never really talked about any specific congenital and abnormalities. You won't have one on the exam that says, with this disease is a congenital abnormalities. That's where you get okay. to, when you get to 240, we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, have a whole lot of them. Vascular diseases, again, are aneurysm is when your uh, blood vessel balloons out, right? It's like blowing a, bu a bubble, uh, becomes very weak, and it can lead to hemorrhage, which if it busts or bursts, blood will then flow out through your brain. If you have a stroke or a massive uh, hemorrhage in your head, massive aneurysm, it can balloon out into your brain. If it pops, then blood will be all in your head, uh, which not, probably 95% of the time will kill you. Uh, loss of blood, 
shock, phlebitis, right? Phlebitis will be inflammation of your veins. You can have some cardiac inflammation like endocarditis, right? Myocarditis, and in those itises means what? Inflammation. Uh, you have atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. Make sure you uh, go back and look at the differences between those. Uh, and then congestive heart failure, very important. That's a left-sided problem. CHF, congestive heart failure. All right, that's the cardiac AMP. Let me move right along. Pulmonary AMP. Pulmonary AMP. All right, we talked about the upper airway, lower airway, and all the destructions thereof. Okay, we won't go over every single thing. You can go back and look at the video and look at your lectures for your studying. But the upper airway basically will warm, humidify, and filter the gas. When gas goes into the nasal passage, it will warm it up and it will humidify it, all right? Uh, through these nasal conchi or nasal conchi turbinates, it swirls around picks up moisture, picks up heat, then goes down toward the lower airway. The upper airway is the nose, the mouth, and the pharynx. Don't forget that the pharynx is made up of three parts listed here. This is just a picture. What'd you say, question? Question? Okay. This is just a picture here of some of the structures inside of the mouth and the upper airway. The lower airway starts where? At the larynx. Airway, lower airway starts at the larynx. Uh, from a hole that goes, you come from the upper airway, you go through a hole into the larynx. What is that hole called? Huh? Mm -mm. The, the entrance from the upper airway into the lower airway. It goes through this hole, not the epiglottis, but the glottis. Good. So it goes through the glottis into the larynx, okay? Talks about the different types of uh, cartilage. You have the epiglottis, the thyroid, and the cricoid cartilage. Special about the cricoid is the only what? Complete ring of the trachea, okay? Only complete ring of the trachea. Yes, ma'am. The epiglottis is the little piece of meat that goes over, not in the back of your throat, but it covers your trachea when you swallow. All right, this is another little diagram here of those parts that we talked about. This is the trachea. Now we get into the tracheobronchial tree. Uh, this is a wonderful picture here of the actual real tracheobronchial tree uh, on a, some type of com computer generated image. <clears throat> this, don't forget your patient's right and your patient's left, not your left and right. When you're thinking about these images, don't forget that uh, this just kind of shows about the different types of um, skin cells or the different types of muscle cells that are located on the tracheobronchial tree. Notice down here, what are these right here called? It's the parenchyma that consists of what? What are these little bubbles right here? Alveoli. Yeah, 300 to 600 million of these. Alveoli, where the magic happens, right? Speaking of alveoli, we have three types of alveolar cells, type one, type two, type three. Make sure you go back and realize or study those types. Don't get them confused. The type one is for gas diffusion, which will be on the outside of the alveoli. The type two cell will be a cell that produces what? Surfactant. And a type three will be your macrophages that eat and ingest foreign material. As the blood passes over the alveoli, the CO2 leaves the bloodstream and oxygen enters the bloodstream. That's called gas exchange or external respiration. External respiration. <clears throat> this is another picture of an alveoli up close. 
What's the number one job for the lungs? External respiration. That's what we just said. Gas exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries. That is external respiration. Internal respiration will be gas exchange between the tissues. So it will be the tissues and the capillaries, right? Down at the tissue level. But from the outside air into the alveoli, and that transfers into the capillary, that's external respiration. The number one job of the lungs, this is a picture of the lobe. The lungs are made up of lobes. The left lung has two lobes and a lingual section, and the right lung has three lobes, upper, middle, lower. Left lung has upper, and lower, and then this section here will be the lingula. Now, the lung has pleura and a cavity, right? We said the, the pleura are the linings. The parietal pleura is the pleura here that is lining the actual ribs. The visceral pleura is the pleura that touches the actual organ or the lung, and in between is a pleural space called the pleural cavity that's filled with what type of fluid? serous fluid. Good. Another picture here. Notice how the visceral pleura is actually touching the lung. Parietal pleura will be the one that would be against the rib cage. Lung and the thorax. Thorax, don't forget, is the bony rib cage that protects the lungs and the heart. That's the thorax. Okay? The sternum and all of your ribs. The lung itself. We said there's only one place. Don't forget that everything that goes into the lung or out of the lungs comes in and out the hilum. Notice the pulmonary artery going in, blood going in, and the blood coming out through the pulmonary veins. Once it goes into the lungs, it gets oxygen and comes out red. Okay. Also, any other type of vessels or uh, the trachea or the uh, left and right main stem bronchus, all that goes in the hilum. Right. This is a picture of your rib cage. You got your sternum, and you have your you have true ribs, you have false ribs and floating ribs. Um, you don't have to know them down pat. Just know that this consists of your thorax. Its main job is what? Protection. Protection. Don't forget there's three parts of that sternum that you need to make sure you know. Uh, and then between those parts, or the as far as the the uh, excuse me, the manubrium and the body and the xiform process. In between the manubrium and the body, there's a little indention called the angle of Lewis, right? That's the angle of Lewis. What do we say is right behind the angle of Lewis? If we wanted to know a landmark, if we go right behind the angle of Lewis would be the what? Not the heart, but before the heart would be the carina. Where the left and right main stem bronchus bifurcate. Where the trachea bifurcates, that's the corona right there in the middle, right? So we always say right behind the angle of Lewis is the corona. This is the mediastinum. Uh, you need to go back into your notes and it tells you everything that the mediastinum protects. Okay, so there might be a multiple, multiple question. It says uh, the mediastinum contains all of these except, right? So make sure you go back and look and see what all is in the mediastinum. All right, the cells. We have uh, cells that produce mucus. Gobs and gobs of mucus are your goblet cells. They continuously produce mucus that lay across the top of your tissue and make up the mucus blanket, all right? You have your tall columnar epithelial cells and every now and then you have a goblet cell that produces the mucus. The mucus then is lays on the tissue, makes up your mucus blanket, uh, and that mucus blanket will then catch all those foreign materials. Like, so if you look right here, this is a mucus blanket here on top of those cells, okay? Those little hair light projections are called cilia, and they move this mucus in one direction. Here it is here. You have cilia, you have your columnar, tall columnar epithelial cells, and you have a goblet cell here and there, right? You have a goblet cell here and there. It produces a bunch of mucus, which will trap these foreign particles and move in one direction, up the tracheobronchial tree, 
so that you can expel it. All right, the diaphragm, how do we breathe? The diaphragm is the number one muscle for ventilation. The, the diaphragm movement can be up to six to 10 centimeters during labeled breathing. But make sure you know how much it moves during regular breathing. How much it moves during regular breathing. Okay, go back and make sure you know that. Uh, if the diaphragm is not enough, then we can kick in what's called our accessory muscles. Uh, we've talked about the accessory muscles. We have the sternocleoid mastoid muscle that will help lift the sternum, right? See how it's connected to the sternum? If the diaphragm is not enough and you're labored breathing, we start to use extra muscles, which are called accessory muscles. Uh, don't forget the main trick about the intercostal muscles. Intercostal muscles are the muscles in between the ribs. The external intercostal muscles help for inspiration and the internal intercostals help with expiration. All right, you definitely will see that question. All right, the muscles we use for forced exhalation are what? Abdominal. Abdominal muscle group is used for forced exhalation. So when you have to do a forced vital capacity or you're trying to blow out some candles, right? Um, or cough, you'll be using your abdominal muscle group. You won't have to remember all the parts of the abdominal muscles. They're just showing you. You have your rectus, abdominus, external obliques, internal obliques, and transverse abdominus. All right. Uh, continued on. You can also use um, uh, your sternocleoid mastoid and your scalene muscles. Uh, they're just talking about pretty much forced inhalation forced inhalation, like if I have to take a deep breath, but I, the diaphragm's not enough and I have to do that really, really fast, like a vital capacity. If I say, take a deep breath, deep breath, deep breath, in, 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 well, then I will be using all of these muscles, right? Not just regular, but I will have to use that sternocleo to help lift that sternum up and let me increase my anterior to posterior diameter. If I can do that of my rib cage, then I'm gonna have more room for my lungs to fill up. Your types of breathing, uh, just know that you need to have, you know, your normal breathing pattern. Uh, we have some different types. Uh, you may see about the, where is it at? Shane Stokes, Shane Stokes breathing pattern. We talked about that. If you have a uh, traumatic brain injury, sometimes you can see Shane Stokes, right? Brain damage. Uh, or cerebral damage or CHF. They will do a pattern called chain stokes and it's kind of like uh, it gets loading, gets real deep, real deep, and then back down and then apnea, right? So changing rates and depths because it, and then deep and deep and deep then stop. Then short, deep, 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 stop. That will be your chain stokes. Uh, you may even see cool small, this one here. Cool small breathing is fast and deep continuously. Just fast and deep. That can happen from metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Those are pretty much normal cool small and chain stokes are the main ones that we talk about. Where all these signals happen, don't forget the, med the medullary, uh, medullary respiratory center. Right, the medullary respiratory center, that's in here, okay? All of this here will be where this magic comes from. Who sends the signal, right? You have your respiratory control centers in the brain stem, right? Uh, you have the pneumotaxic center. Don't forget what we talked about, the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center uh, in the actual lecture. Uh, in your notes, you should have that then your dorsal and your ventral respiratory groups, what they're responsible for. And this is the easy part, the stethoscope. Make sure you know your stethoscope. Of course, you have your ear tips, your binaural uh, tubing here, and then you have your listening tube here, which leads to the bell side and the diaphragm side. The big side is the diaphragm side, the small side is the bell side. Okay. Again, make sure you guys have your stethoscope on and fully dressed out for your orals tomorrow. 
I can be fully dressed out. All right, breath sounds. Breath sounds. Huh? You're going to be online, virtual, but you have to be dressed out. So, vesicular. Vesicular. What is vesicular breath sound? Normal, normal breath sounds. When it's called vesicular, if you listen to a patient and the doctor says, oh, he has vesicular breath sound, that means normal. They're either vesicular or they are adventitious. Don't forget, adventitious sounds or means not normal, right? And you have different types. You have crackles, ronca, friction rub, and wheezes. The wheezes are those musical sounds. It can either happen on inspiration or expiration. Those will be your wheezes. Your crackles will come from a lot of fluid. If somebody has CHF or something with extra fluid or pulmonary edema, you will hear crackles. That's what you would hear, okay? Uh, kind of gives you a little description of how they sound and really pretty good, really pretty good, like rolling hair together, right? Or uh, gurgles or the ronchi sound like a snoring, like somebody snoring inside. Uh, friction rub. The friction rub, I always found if you wash dishes and you have Tupperware, when it's nice and clean, you rub your wet thumb against Tupperware, it makes a little sound. That's what friction rub means. That means the plural are touching. The parado, uh, parado plural and the visceral plural are touching. And that makes a sound. That's not a good thing because that can be very, very painful to your patient. That's burning, getting hot because of friction. And um, it's hurting. There's no serous fluid in between there, right? That's the whole reason we have serous fluid in between the pleura is to prevent friction, right? And if that's gone for whatever reason, uh, you have a pleural rub. That's very, very painful to your patient. All right, of course, the segments, you need to know your segments. You need to know your segments. You will have several segment questions. I didn't say you will, but there are several segment questions in the orals. They're going to be shuffled up, and the instructor's just going to pick 20 questions for you. They're not looking for certain ones just to ask you. They're going to be mixed up, but you will have at least four or five ABGs. But as far as you may not get any segment questions, that would be good, right? But then you may get two or three segment questions, just depending on how to draw, all right? So know your segments. Know your segments. All right, bronchioles. Remember, the generation for gas exchange is the respiratory bronchioles. So you start with the trachea, then your left and right main stem bronchus, then your bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, and then respiratory bronchioles. This is where the gas exchange begins, starts to begin, in the parenchyma lane. All the other airways are conducting zones, right? Remember we said they're just conductions, like getting on a bus, and the bus takes you through all of the city and lets you out in the land of the parenchyma. That's where the gas exchange happens, in the respiratory bronchioles. Not the terminal bronchioles, but the respiratory bronchioles. All right. All right, it is 1.45. Let's take a 10-minute break. Come back at 55 after, we're going to continue on with pulmonary mechanics. Pause the record. All right, guys, so we're back. Uh, we're going to go and get into the lung volume pulmonary mechanics. The pulmonary mechanics, go back and look at those notes well. But the main thing, you guys, uh, that I'm going to touch on are those volumes and capacities. Make sure we understand those. Um, and also, let me share my screen. This is the sign up sheet as of now you notice that you have two slots available for 8 a.m two slots for 8 45 two slots for 9 30 and only one slot left for one o'clock so if you're not able to log in for some reason and get it you need to be emailing me so i can put it in because it's first okay, so if you wanted eight o'clock but two people already got it then you can't get eight o'clock okay uh, so you need to eat, hit me up or let me know you know during class, during a break time or something like that, and I'll put you in there. Okay, yeah. All right, so Miss Shepard, I'll put you in there for one o'clock, so we don't have any more one o'clock available. Only thing left now is eight 
8.45 and 9.30. That's all we have left. So if you decide and you want to, you know, I don't think I have a couple of people. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Only have two more people who haven't signed up. So, I mean, and I don't even know if they're going to take it. So we might be good now. All right. Moving right along. Lung volumes. Lung volumes are very, very important. Uh, you have to know your differences between your lung volumes. Be practicing that spirogram. Be able to draw that box, draw the box and know what that is. I mean, if you've been practicing that, that should come pretty easy to you guys. But it's a lot. I know it's a lot because you're going to have to know how to explain it and how much it is. All right, so lung volumes. IRV, you have lung volumes and lung capacity. Lung capacity. The volumes are inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. These what the lung volumes look like. You have your tidal volume in the middle, which is about 0.5 liters or 500 mLs. Then above that, right, everything above tidal volume is your inspiratory reserve volume, okay? Uh, so if you imagine yourself breathing normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, after a normal in, I push more, more, more in, that's my inspiratory reserve. So my inspiratory reserve volume is the volume that can be inhaled after a normal inhalation, right? This is normal in, normal out. So after the normal inhalation, I keep on going in, that's my inspiratory reserve volume. When I talk about expiratory reserve volume, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, and after my normal out, everything that I can push out after a normal exhalation will be my expiratory reserve volume, which with the re, uh, reserve or residual volume will be left, can't be touched. So my IRV is 3.1 liters or 3,100 milliliters. My Expiratory reserve volume or ERV is 1.2 liters and reserve volume or residual volume is 1.2 liters as well. Those are my volumes, right? Here it is again, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in. And then what they did here is showing you that all the air that I can push out after a normal in is my what? It's your, it's your um, ERV is after your normal out, right? Mm, I wanna know what it is, what is the, all the air that's in the after, all the air you can push out after a normal end. Not RV, that's what's left. So think about it. If I have, this is what I want you to know. If I normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. After I breathe out normal, right? What's left in my lungs after a normal out? Let's put it like that. What's left, what's the amount of volume left in my lungs after a normal out? So look, look at my pointer and go from normal out all the way down to the bottom. What is all of this considered? That's ERV plus RV. What is all of that considered? What's that called? Uh -uh. Look, normal in, normal out. After my normal out, what's left in my lungs after a normal out? Look at this. ERV plus RV. What's ERV plus RV? Anybody? FRC. FRC. That's your FRC functional residual capacity. Everything that's left in the lungs after a normal out. So you look at it, normal out, okay, you got this part, which is the ERV plus RV. ERV plus RV is FRC. It's not on here. It's not written on here yet. It's not on here yet. What about, uh, let's see. Now, what you was asking me earlier, everything that I can do, is what? Vital capacity. vital capacity. So if I go 
everything I can push in and everything I can blow out, right? So from this up here to way down here, this to this is vital capacity. Everything that the Asia can do is vital capacity. What's left in the lungs after a forceful exhalation? Residual, right? So what's left in the lungs after a normal exhalation is my FRC. What's left in my lungs after a forced exhalation is my RV, okay? All right. Inspiratory reserve volume, they're just breaking it down here. 3.1 is a maximum inhalation following a quiet inhalation. So right here, quiet in, right? And then I kept on going, right? That from here to here is IRV. From here to here, that's IRV. 3.1 liters. Tidal volume, normal in, normal out. That's what you're doing right now. Tidal volume, in, out, in, out in out so that is my vt from this point to this point is vt 0.5 liters erv maximum exhalation following a quiet exhalation so quiet in quiet out and then about push as far as i can go that's just this part after a quiet out is just this left and that's your erv expiratory reserve volume 1.2 liters and then finally, your residual volume is gas remaining in the lungs after a maximum exhalation, 1.2 liters. So after I blow, 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 far as I can blow, there's still some air in my lungs. That's my reserve or also known as residual volume. Now we get into the capacities. The capacities. Capacities uh, consist of two or more volumes or capacities, right? This is when you start adding some things right? Adding some things is when you get into your capacity. You got IC, FRC, VC, and TLC. Go back and look at that lecture that I had the, the box. Remember, I had the box on the, um, I had the box up on the, on the wall, the spirogram, and I had my folder, and I was covering up. I said, if I do FRC minus the RV, what's left, right? If I said, if I do, um, uh, inspiratory capacity and take away the tidal volume, what's left will be IRV, right? That's how you help yourself subtract and add these different quantities, okay? Know how to do that, I promise you. If you know how, and you can do either the one that is a waveform one, if you like that one better and you learned that one, then do that one. But either the waveform or the square box, be prepared to draw that on your oral day. And on your final day, if you say, Mr. McCarthy, can I draw this? Of course you can. As long as everything is put up, then I'm going to give you a scrap sheet of paper like I always do. And you're going to put down your spirogram. Whatever formula that comes to your heart, you can draw it. I don't care what it is. Okay? It's not cheating if it's coming from your head. All right? So I don't have a problem with that. But, so go back and learn these so you can at least know it enough to write it down. So then when you're looking at it, it's easier for you to be successful, okay? All right, so let's look at them. Capacities. Vital capacity is everything you can do, okay? Vital capacity is pointing to this blue line here, all right? And so if you start with tidal volume, let's just say this is top normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, right? So if I'm regular normal out, everything I go in, I'm going in, 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 tidal volume, in, 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 inspiratory reserve volume, then blow, 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 through my expiratory reserve volume to this line here. So from here to here is vital capacity. That's everything that you can do. Ooh, come on me up. Everything that you can do is vital capacity. All right, TLC is the red, everything, everything, every, every, everything is your TLC, total lung capacity. So let's look at inspiratory capacity. Inspiratory capacity, when I think about it, is my capacity to what? Inhale, right? So I can inhale tidal volume and I can inhale inspiratory reserve volume. That's the only inhale capacities I have, right? 
That's the only thing I can inhale is tidal volume and IRV, right? So those two together is my inspiratory capabilities, right? Ca uh, capacity, you can say capability. So my, co my ability or my capability to inhale is everything that's inhaled. Inspiratory reserve volume and tidal volume both have inhale in them. So that's my inspiratory capacity. After you exhale quietly, a normal quiet exhalation, there is long, uh, there is volume in your lungs after a normal exhalation, and that's your FRC, like Judith said, FRC. Okay, right, which is functional residual capacity. Now, remember, functional residual capacity is synonymous with compliance. The higher your compliance, the higher your FRC, right? So therefore, somebody finish this for me. A high compliance equals a high FRC. Therefore, a high COPD equals what type of compliance? A high one. Because a high compliance equals a high FRC. And, and I, I should have got you this one too. COPD equals a higher compliance. So see, if I know those two to be true, then COPD is a high, what type of compliance? Higher, or what type of FRC? High, right, it's all high. Because they can't get the air out. So when they normal exhale out, their normal out is higher than yours because they can't get it all out, right? So their normal out is gonna be a higher level, all right? Don't forget that. FRC is synonymous with compliance. The higher the compliance, the higher the FRC. Here's a spirogram if you want to do it this way. Some people like it this way, okay? They don't like the box. They like it this way. If you like it this way, that's fine. It's just as good as the box. So feel free to look at that and play with that tonight. Inspiratory capacity. That is IRV plus my VT, right? Now they're breaking it down. Inspiratory capacity is IRV plus my VT. Uh, the maximum inhalation following a quiet exhalation. So we're talking about capacity now. Maximum inhalation following a quiet exhalation is my IC. And I was at the club the other day and I see 3.6 mafia, right? 3.6. All right. FRC or functional residual capacity. Sometimes you may see functional reserve capacity, same thing. ERV plus the RV, that is the gas in the lung following a quiet exhalation, which when you add ERV 1.2 plus RV 1.2, you get an FRC of 2.4. Vital capacity is everything that you can do. IRV plus VT plus ERV equals your VC. Maximum exhalation following a maximum inspiration. So breathe in, 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 and then blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out. Those are the type of things you want to hear when you walk by the PFT room in your hospital. All right, 4.8. Then finally, total lung capacity is everything that the lungs can do. All of the volumes and capacities of the lungs is everything. IRV plus VT plus ERV plus RV equals your TLC. You can also say your vital capacity plus your RV equals your TLC, right? It's different ways to get to it. But the amount is six liters. All right, FRC and compliance. FRC is the most consistent lung I mean, consistent volume diaphragm at rest. At FRC, equalization of opposing forces and pulmonary and thoracic elasticity. Remember, we said the reason why you breathe is because of change in what? The reason why gas can go in and out of the lungs is because of changes in what? I'm asking. The reason, we're talking about physics, right? The reason why air can even go into your body or go out of your body is because of change in what? What's the number one thing? What has to change in order for it to move? And then we said gas runs away from? Oh, pressure. Pressure, pressure, 
okay? Change in pressure. Yeah, don't overthink it. So, but you're on the right track. A change in pressure, good. Whoever wrote that in the chat. Pressure. So, it runs away from pressure. So, the lower pressure, that's where the gas is going to go. So, when we take a deep breath in, our diaphragm contracts, right? It descends, and the intrapleural pressure becomes more negative than the atmospheric pressure. So, it's going to say, shoo, whichever one is low. So the air outside is going to fall into the lungs because it's low pressure inside the lungs. When I'm ready to exhale, I will become more positive than the outside and air will run from me and go into the ambient, right? In and out. Change in pressure, all right? So what they're saying is FRC is equalization of pressure. At FRC, the ambient pressure and the lung pressure is the same. That's why nothing's moving. FRC is the gas in the lung after a resting exhalation. So when you exhale, nothing's moving no more, right? After you exhale normally, nothing's moving at that moment. At that moment, everything is equal. The outside air or outside pressure and the intrapleural pressures are the same. That's why nothing moves. That happens at FRC. All right? Also, don't forget that elasticity has a plan. We talked about elasticity. Now, we said FRC and compliance go the same way, but compliance and elasticity go opposite ways, right? Compliance means the lungs will do whatever you want them to do, right? And elasticity is how tight it is, okay? So if you have a low compliance, it won't do what I want it to do, right? So we talked about old draws. The band and the old draws have lost their elasticity. So they have a high compliance, right? So low elasticity equals high compliance. High elasticity equals low compliance. So uh, for you that know that rubber band that comes from a broccoli, when you buy broccoli, it's got that thick, tight rubber band on it, right? Well, that rubber band, if you were asking me what kind of compliance is in that rubber band, it's going to be a low compliance because it won't do what you want it to do easy, right? It's tight. So it has a low compliance, but it has a high elasticity. Understand? Now, let's bring that to the lungs. Which disease has a low elasticity, also known as floppy lung? Emphysema. So emphysema is synonymous with COPD. And COPD is synonymous with what type of compliance? COPD, yeah. COPD has what type of compliance? A high compliance. High compliance, good. Yeah, y'all right, y'all say it out loud because when I have to go to this chat, sometimes it don't work. I can't get to it and I won't know who's saying what. So feel free to just say it when I ask those questions. So think about it. If you have COPD, you have a high compliance, right? If you have a high compliance, that means you have a low elasticity. And we know that if uh, emphysema is a COPD disease, so emphysema has a high compliance because the elasticity is so low. That's why uh, it's called floppy lungs. They're just floppy, right? It's like an old elbow. Somebody big old, the meat on your elbow. It's how, how, just how flaccid it is. Just there, right? That's how their lungs are, okay? They have no snap back to them. Okay. And y'all, y'all amuse us with your imaginations when we talked about that then. So just keep that line of thought going. It's the same thing. All right. FRC is directly impacted by the compliance. Again, decreased compliance means stiff lungs, right? Stiff lungs mean a high elasticity, right? An increased compliance means a decreased elasticity or floppy lungs, right? All right, so that's the main thing about um, uh, ele uh, the uh, pulmonary mechanics. Well, those volumes and those capacities, but make sure you go back and look at those compliance, what the formula is for compliance, uh, things like that, okay? Uh, ventilations, make sure you go back for your minute ventilation. So let me see, I think I had something here. Let's look at this biogram quiz. You're not going to do them all, but I'm, it's here. It's being recorded, so you can always go back and look at these. So look at 1 through 10, right? 1 through 10, let's just call out a couple of them. 
and then the answers are involved. So the answers are there and I'll scroll up and let you see the answer. So when you go back and study it, you can see that and test yourself, okay? So these are the questions here. And let's just do, we'll do one or two. Uh, number eight, everybody look at number eight. Total lung capacity, take away the vital capacity, leaves you with what? I ain't sharing my screen? Oh, I might not be, hold on. Let me share my screen. There we go. Number eight, total lung capacity minus vital capacity leaves you with what? Residual volume, good. Residual, especially when you, if you're covering it up, you should be able to say, okay, TLC, and I take away the whole vital capacity. The only thing left is my residual volume. Good. What about, uh, let's just say, what about uh, number nine? Tidal volume plus IRV gives you what? Inspiratory capacity. Excellent. All right, so it's recording. Here those there, and here are the answers. All right. So you can pause that and study that at home. All right, got that in there. Let me uh make sure you go over y'all those uh your formulas on your formulas page in your notes for your uh, uh, when I say minute ventilation, alveolar minute ventilation, right? Don't forget how to do those. Minute ventilation is uh, frequency times the tidal volume, okay? That's minute ventilation. That's how much volume is going in and out of the lungs in one minute. I don't know. It's a hundred questions on there. It might be spread out, and they are. They're not going to be in a, in in order. So you need to know your formulas. Uh, also, alveolar minute ventilation. We have to take into account of the dead space, right? So alveolar minute ventilation will be uh, frequency times tidal volume minus dead space. That will give us our alveolar minute ventilation. Food for thought. If I increase the dead space, I'm going to decrease the alveolar minute ventilation. Excuse me. If I increase the dead space, then I'm going to decrease my overall alveolar minute ventilation. That is the most important part because only the gas in the alveoli is partic participating in what, the Gas exchange. Gas exchange. All right? All right, moving right along. After pulmonary mechanics, I believe, was gas laws and physics. Huh? Yeah, I just did that. Gas laws and physics. Uh, so let me share my screen on that. I hate when it does that. Come on, man. Okay. Here we go. Gas laws and physics. Slideshow. And this one's kind of, it's just, you know, cut and dry. This is your tanks and stuff like that. Those just, you know, it ain't, this one was kind of easy. You guys did the best with this one. Uh, but just remember, this is when we start introducing people's names. Okay. This is when we start. We talk about gases, uh, the states of matter, solid liquid gas, same, same substance, but it can be in three different ways. Okay, same matter. Everything can be either a solid, liquid, or a gas. Believe me, even you. I can turn you into a gas. I can turn you into a, a, a liquid. All right? Any piece of matter can change into these three. Uh, gases. Avogadro's law talks about the mole. Avogadro, the mole. So if you see something about a mole, right, then you know they're talking about Avogadro. He says that 
One mole of a gas at standard temperature pressure is 22.4 liters of space. That's how much it occupies. That's considered a mole, a mole of gas, and that's Avogadro. Then we got into our pressures, talked about barometric pressure. It's what you use so much going forward. The normal barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, but it's also this. We didn't talk about this that much, but it is there in this fair game. Uh, it may say, what is the normal barometric pressure? And they give you choices, but what if they say 1,034 centimeters of water and they don't give you 760? Then you need to know, I need to choose that one. Or if they say 33 feet of water, it's also considered barometric pressure, okay? So you need to know that. And here they are right here. I'm telling you right now, here they are, okay? More than likely to be 760, but be prepared to see that, especially on your board exam when you get out, right? They like to really throw you curveballs then, okay? Oh, my bad. All right, so as far as pressure is concerned, we said that water inside the lungs occupies space and it exerts a pressure inside of the alveoli. How much is that pressure? Water vapor consists of how much pressure? Water vapor. Think about the alveolar air equation. P bar, which is barometric pressure, minus the pressure of 47. water. 47. 47, good. 47 millimeters of mercury, right here. 47 millimeters of mercury. Don't forget, millimeters of mercury and centimeters of water are your pressure measurements. The two pressures that we deal with. Millimeters of mercury inside the body, centimeters of water mostly outside the body. All right? Dalton's law. Dalton says, he's the one who makes up barometric pressure. Right? He says that all the gases in the atmosphere exert a pressure. Yes, they have a percentage, but that percentage also exerts a pressure. And when you add all the pressures up, it's the barometric, yeah, the barometric gumbo, right? It equals up to one flavor, which is the barometric pressure. But if I take each individual ingredient out of your gumbo, I should taste its, its flavor by itself, its own individual taste. The carrots taste like carrots. The sausage tastes like sausage. What else is in gumbo? Rice. Rice just tastes like rice. I don't know. I've never had it, but I, what else? Crawfish, shrimp. I, everything should have its own taste. But when you put it all together, people say, "Oh, that's that's uh, that's Judith's gumbo right there, right? Oh, that's oh, that's my mama gumbo, right?" It has a taste, right? You don't taste every individual thing then. So that's what barometric pressure is, guys. It's one pressure in the atmosphere that's made up of a bunch of different pressures, okay? Here are all the concentrations that we spoke about. Oxygen is 21%, right? Nitrogen, 78%. Uh, argon is 0.93%, right? Carbon dioxide, 0.03%. And then trace gases is about uh, 0.01 percent. So we call that the farts, right? The methane, which is from from human or animal uh, gas that come from human living beings, is methane, right? Which is the fart. Okay. If you want to convert those into pressures, you multiply each one of those by 760. You have to turn them into a decimal and multiply them by 760, right? So let's just say uh, oxygen is 20. We just rounded to 21 percent. Right? Well, we have to say 0 0.21 times 760 will give us the pressure, which is 159 millimeters of mercury. All right. Here it is, what I just talked about, how to do it, showing you right here. Right? Partial pressure of the gas, I want to know what it is. P bar times the, that concentration. So for example, oxygen is 21%. You change 21 into a decimal, which by moving it over two times to the left. When you change a decimal to a fraction, you move the decimal point two places to the left. So 21 turns into 0.21, right? times 760, and now we know the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 159 millimeters of mercury, right? So it kind of breaks down uh, the, the alveolar air equation a little bit more, talks about how we got those pressures, 
Uh, <clears throat> so make sure you know your alveolar air equation. What is the alveolar equation? I'm glad you asked. It is the P big A O2, which is FO2 times your P bar minus your water pressure. Then we have to subtract the CO2 and divide it by the respiratory quotient. Make sure you do what's in parentheses first and follow your steps to, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Uh, don't forget, the big A is alveolar, little a is what? Arterial. So P is pressure. So the pr partial pressure of alveolar oxygen, that's what the P big A O2 stands for, the pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, okay? P little AO2 is the pressure of arterial oxygen, okay? So these are the parts of the alveolar air equation. Uh, sometimes you see it modified without the RQ, okay? Now, tell me if this is right. What if I had this right here written down? Is this correct? Because the FO2 is not on this side, but does that matter? No. It's multiplication, so it doesn't matter if it's over here or over here. It can be FO2 times the P bar minus water pressure, or you can do P bar minus water pressure times FO2, because you're gonna do what's in parentheses first anyway, right? So the P bar minus the water pressure, you're gonna do that first, and then you multiply by the FO2, and then subtract the CO2 and the RQ from it, okay? Don't forget. Then we get into our gas laws, Though those triangles, those triangles that I put up on the board are your gas laws. You have Boyle's law, talks about how volume and pressure are inversely proportional. Charles's law says that volume and temperature are directly proportional. Gay Lussac says temperature and pressure are directly proportional, right? And all the gases' temperatures are measured in what? Kelvin. Kelvin, good. All right. So when we get into our cylinders, get into our cylinders. Uh, there, are, don't forget there's agencies. Everybody has a hand in the pot about the transportation and the storage of your oxygen cylinders, right? You got the DOT. You gotta know what they're for. The HHS, what do they do? OSHA, what does OSHA stand for? Occupational Safety and Health Administration, not association, because if you get a choice and say association, it's gonna be wrong. And then you say, oh, y'all could have gave us it. No, we couldn't have. I'm telling you what it is. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, okay? Uh, what about the AARC? What does that stand for? Accredited something. Credited. Associated, associate something. Yep. So make sure you look at that. What about MBRC? Good. National Board of Respiratory Care. So okay. what is the AARC? American Association for Respiratory Care. All right. Recommending bodies. You got the CGA. Now, uh, NFPA, the Z79. Make sure you remember what they're for. Okay, like I said, there's a lot of people with their hand in the game for these cylinders. Colors for cylinders. The main thing would be the uh, air, room air or medical air is yellow. Green is oxygen, except for internationally, it's white, right? Carbon dioxide will be gray. Nitrous oxide is blue, uh, helium brown, and nitrogen is black. Those are the ones you see the most, right? It's part into safety systems. Safety system, the first safety system is color coding, okay? The first safety system is color coding. The next safety system was your PIN index safety system, your PISS. Those are the ones that have the pin and yoke, have the yoke and pin connections at different locations. Oxygen is two and five, air is one and five, CO2, one and six, see? These right here have your pin connections to keep you from putting the wrong regulator on the wrong cylinder. 
These are used mainly for your e-cylinders and smaller. Then you have your big ass tanks, right? Your ASSS, American Standard Safety System. For the large tanks, it has the nipple and threaded nut, right? Uh, <clears throat> then it has uh, the, it, well, it's for your H cylinders, your G tanks, right? And then you have your DISS, which is your diameter. Huh? Okay. Your diameter index safety system is your DISS, right? That will be everything after the regulator, okay? Those are everything after your regulator. So your, uh, your nasal cannula will hook up to your DISS. Your uh, high flow uh, aerosol face mask, aerosol T-piece, aerosol face tint, all of those things we set up, they screw into the flow meter at the DISS, okay? What are the qualities of cylinder gases? Qualities. Well, we have some that are flammable, which will be ethylene and cyclopropane. Those are flammable. Then you have some non-flammable are nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and helium. Those are all non-flammable. Then you have gases that support combustion. Please remember that oxygen is not flammable, but it does support combustion. So that means if something is combusting, it will support it, but it won't cause combustion, okay? It doesn't cause the fire, it just feeds it. Now, oxygen supports combustion or oxygen, that anything that has oxygen in it will support combustion, right? And then also nitrous oxide also supports combustion. Nitrous oxide, a lot of times, you see people using uh, laughing gas, right? Have you ever been to the dentist and they gave you that little gas and made you feel good and make you laugh a little and giggle and forget about what's going on? You ever had that? Okay, that's what that is. So let's look at oxygen in particular. The qualities of oxygen in particular are it's colorless, odorless, and tasteless. However, when you start using it and playing with it, you it, to me, it does have a, a smell. It has an atomic weight of 16 grams and a molecular weight of 32 grams. The most important thing in this section is the critical temperature of liquid oxygen. Critical temperature, do not get them confused. Negative 118.8 Celsius or negative 181.1 Fahrenheit. Okay, don't forget that. If it climbs above that temperature, it can no longer remain a liquid it turns into gas okay it turns into gas so make sure you go back and look at the cylinder markings and tests and we're not going over all of that uh the cylinder uh filling and duration what's the duration of flow tank pressure times the tank factor over liter flow that will tell us how long a cylinder lasts these are your factors here don't forget your factors and always round to the lowest hour, okay? Now, when you first get your answer, it's going to be in minutes, right? It's gonna be in minutes. You have to convert that to hours by dividing by 60, right? And if it's still a lot, you can divide that by 24, and that'll give you days. If it's still a lot, then you can divide it by seven, and then it'll give you weeks, right? So that's how that works. Break it down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, the capacities you notice here, even though the E cylinder, the G cylinder, and the H cylinder are all different sizes, they still have a pressure of what? 2200 PSI. 2200 PSI or PSIG, that's the same thing. All right, don't forget the, uh, about how cylinders are handled, right? You got cylinders that are must be in a carrier or a stand. Uh, Make sure you know the process. That is, I mean, I know I did that one really well on the video. I talked about how you put on a regulator, how you take one off. Go back and look at those. Uh, and we talked about how often are they tested? How often are the cylinders tested? Five to 10 years. Every five to 10 years, good. All right. Gaseous bulk systems. Not a whole lot of questions on bulk, but you know, you can, you can look at that. It's not going to ask a whole lot of questions about uh, all the different type of bulk systems. 
just know that outside your hospital, there will be a liquid O2 system and they will be filled up by the liquid O2 driver. He will come or she will come and lit, fill up the liquid tank that's outside and it will be stored at about a negative 183. So well below the critical temperature, right? If somebody told you that you got to store this meat at 20 degrees Fahrenheit or it's going to go bad and kill your family. But when you put the meat in the refrigerator, you're going to put it right at 20. You're going to put it well below 20 to make sure we don't get to 20, right? So you're going to have down to 15 degrees to make sure, right? So that's the same thing we do with oxygen. Instead of we know that the critical temperature is negative 118 Celsius, we're going to store it at negative 183 to make sure we well below uh, its critical temperature, okay? And remember that our using oxygen in a liquid form gives us more economical use, right? Well more, it lasts so much longer. Look at it. One cubic foot of liquid O2 can give us 860 cubic feet of gaseous O2. That's a big difference, right? That's a big difference. You think about it in money, if they say, well, you, you, if you use this car, one gallon of gas to get you um, one 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 gallon of gas to get you 50 miles in this car or one gallon of gas to get you 800 miles in this other car. Which one are you going to choose? The one that gives you the big one, right? So that's the same thing. It's economical. It makes dollars and it makes sense. Okay. This is a cross section of a hospital, how oxygen is piped into the hospital. Don't forget that we have piping zones in the hospital. Who's responsible for telling the staff to cut off the oxygen? Who is the only person who can tell the hospital staff? Yeah. What agency, what's the only agency can tell the hospital? Uh -huh. They can tell the, the, chief. the chief, the fire chief, right? The fire department. Yes, they will call and say, you need to cut off the oxygen to this building, to that building, or this section with the piping zones. We have zones where there's a little open glass window with pipes inside. You open up that glass and they have a lever that cuts off the oxygen, the air, or the vacuum, right? Because if it gets too high or there's a fire, right, in the building, we're going to go cut that off because it supports combustion, make it worse, right? So the fire chief will say, go and turn that off. Who do they tell that to, the nurses or respiratory? Respiratory. Respiratory is responsible for cutting it off. They get direct talk to the fire chief. The fire chief says, I need to speak to your respiratory therapist. I need you to go cut off the oxygen zone five, zone six, wherever it is, okay? Oh, you're going to have to know. They're going to know that anyway, because they're going. the respiratory department is going to teach you where those zones are, part of your policy. The first couple of days will be paperwork, 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 videos, 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 okay? But you're getting paid for it, so who cares? All right? Don't forget the standard working pressure of oxygen. 50 PSI. We put the regulator on, we want that oxygen regulator pressure to go down to a standard working pressure of 50 PSI. All right? Now, what's the difference between knowing how much is left in a gaseous tank or knowing how much is left in an, uh, a liquid tank? When we do the duration of flow, right? So when we do duration of flow for gas, we say tank factor times the pressure, right, divided by the liter flow. Well, to find out how long liquid lasts, we simply do pounds of liquid times 344 divided by liters per minute. Just weigh it. So instead of looking at the pressure, we look at the weight. All right, concentrators. These are little machines that we have for some of our patients that are at home or on home oxygen. They have a machine that constantly, 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 constantly makes oxygen, right? It's called an oxygen concentrator. It concentrates the air that it sucks in into pure oxygen, right? You have two types, the membrane type and molecular sieve type. The molecular sieve type is the best one. You can get up to 90% FiO2 with the molecular sieve, okay? You don't really know how, have to know how each one works. Just know that there's two types, the membrane type and the molecular sieve. All right, and finally, regulators and flow meters. Regulators reduce high tank pressure down to a standard working pressure of 50 PSI. 
You can either have a single stage regulator or a multi-stage. All it is is count the reducing valves. If the regulator has two reducing valves, it's a two standard or a two stage regulator. If it has three, it's a three or multi-stage regulator. If it only has one reducing valve, it's a single stage regulator, okay? It does the breaking down in one step, okay? <clears throat> this is just a couple pictures of some regulators. Regulator, what is this gauge right here called? The gauge that's on these regulators is called the what kind of gauge? It's a pressure gauge, but what, what kind of pressure gauge? It reads the pressure. I mean, uh, measures the pressure, but reads the flow. What, what kind of gauge is this? Starts with a B. Bordon. This is the Bordon gauge, right? When you cut the cylinder on, this little uh, hand will go, remember it moves to however much pressure is in the cylinder. Full is considered 2200. 2200 PSI is considered full on any cylinder. All right, so we just talked about the multi-stage and the single stage. Just remember that it is, it counts the reducing valves. Okay, count the reducing valves. Now, preset regulator is a single or multi-stage that has to be set, okay? Uh, usually they set it at 50. Sometimes you set it at other things. It just depends on what they need at the hospital. If it's able to do more than one working pressure, then it's considered to be adjustable, okay? Uh, I don't know why they would need more than 50, uh, and I've never seen an adjustable, but evidently there are some. All right, this is the one that people had problems with. Compensation of the Thorpe tube. Compensation. Is the Thorpe tube compensated or not, right? Well, bottom line is, in a compensated Thorpe tube, the needle flow, the needle valve is distal to the flow. Look at your plate. You, you, uh, look at your, uh, you looking at the, the, the laptop? I mean, look at your picture. I'm, are you on? Oh, okay. The needle valve, look at this needle valve right here. See, this is the gas flow coming from the wall. So the wall will be right here, okay? This is the float, that little ball that's inside of the flow meter. If the needle valve is distal to the flow or after the flow, it's compensated. If the needle valve was over here and proximal to the flow, it will be non-compensated, okay? We want a compensated flow meter because that lets us know if there's an interruption in the flow, right? If something happens uh, and the, the nasal cannula or whatever becomes kinked, then the ball will start to drop. If I thought it was on 10 liters and then the hospital bed rolls over. Um, the hospital bed rolls over the uh, the nasal cannula. Well, then now my pressure is dropping, and it goes from ten to whatever that pressure is, right? And so that means it's compensated. So if I'm looking at those, hold on, I thought he was on ten liters, and it's down to one. Something's wrong. That gives me an alert to say he's not getting the oxygen he's supposed to be getting. But if it was not a compensated flow meter, it would still be at ten. That whole nasal cannula could be completely obstructed, but it still shows you 10. So while he over there turning blue, you look at the ball and say he on 10 and go back to Instagram. Okay, that's how you get fired. All right, so there it is right there, uncompensated, uncompensated. Don't get it twisted. Make sure you know the difference between distal and proximal. They may throw that in there all types of ways. We know that the needle valve is distal to the float. That's compensated. But they may say that the float is proximal to the needle valve. And that's true. The float is before the needle valve. So be careful with your directional terms. All right, again, this is your board on gauge here. All right, board on gauge. Uh, don't forget one quick thing about um, the mixtures, heliox. Sometimes we use helium and oxygen. Uh, here's those things here, 80% to 20% mix, the flow will actually be one times higher than the meter, meter reading. If you're using a 70-30 mixture, then the flow can be 1.6 times the meter reading. All right. And that does it for the, um, that one. All right, moving right along. Going into Acid-based therapy, acid-based chemistry, ABGs. Now, it's not a whole, whole lot. 
to talk about with those. Those will be just doing your ABGs, guys. Knowing your ABG, knowing your your formula. I mean, not your formula, but your normal values, right? I'm going to say them, say a couple, talk about oxygen and CO2 transport, and you go back and look at your reading and your uh, lectures for more information. The main thing on ABGs will be actual ABGs. Okay, that's the main thing. We talk about oxygen being carried two different ways. So let's take another 10 minute break. It's 2.45 or it's 2.50. Let's just come back at three o'clock. We're gonna jump into uh, oxygen transport. Come back at three o'clock. We're gonna break till three o'clock and come back to oxygen transport. Pause the recording here for another break to 3 p.m. Okay, guys, we're back. We're moving right along from where we left off. Keep in mind that we will be, uh, I still will be doing, even though you guys will be doing your orals tomorrow, I still will be doing mm -hmm. some review, okay? So whatever I don't finish, I still review. Uh, we're going to take your oral, come on back. You don't have to. You can go back and look at it for the weekend. Whatever I don't finish today, you guys can look at it over the weekend for your final, okay? Um, which is a hundred questions, huh? Yeah. No, tomorrow all you got to do is log in at, at that time. He's going to have, I'm, I'm going to make the announcement. Let me make sure I'm recording so everybody can hear. Okay, so as far as your oral test for tomorrow, so you don't have, you know, everybody understands. You will get a, I mean, it will be a module in the canvas that says oral exam, okay? He's going to either put it in there tonight or really, really early in the morning because nobody really um, has signed up for the morning time. The earliest one we have, I think it's like, what, 1 o'clock or 10, 30, something like that. So he'll, he'll put it in either tonight or early in the morning. He'll add a module to this, your program. And you'll go down, you'll see it. It'll say oral exam. And that's going to have a link in there that you click to get to the oral. All right. So when you say you, for instance, sign up at one o'clock. Well, at one o'clock, you need to open up the module that says oral exam. Okay. Go to it and click it. And it's going to lead you right to that instructor who's going to be doing you at one o'clock. Okay. So it's, and it's going to be two. I think I got two people signed up for one o'clock. So it'll be two different instructors doing those students at one o'clock. That's how that's going to work. So when you're done with that, uh, depending on what time it is, later on that afternoon, you can look at the recorded lecture that I'm going to do tomorrow. So while y'all, because I can't do orals. So while y'all are doing your orals, I'll be recording a lecture. So I may even start at 8 o'clock in the morning and just go ahead and get the recorded lecture out the way. So when you're done with your orals, you can go back and look at it, right? Or uh, you may even get a chance to look at some more of it before you even do your orals. But everything that you've already studied for, uh, you should be prepared for your oral, okay? Um, and your final, because you have to study every day, okay? We talked about that very, very in depth because it's such a fast paced program and so much information. You have to go back, right? You have to continue to go back and, and study. So I will, but I will be doing that. So, you know, you take your oral and then you can look at it for the weekend. You got all weekend. To study for your final. You take your oral tomorrow, then you'll study, study, study uh, tomorrow night, Saturday, Sunday, and be ready on Monday. Take that oral, and that's all you got to do for that Monday is take your, I mean, take your final, is take your final that Monday. Come in here, log in, take your final, okay? Uh, let me see. Same time, uh, if you need to come a little early and take yours, you can, like, like I always do. Uh, I can't take it at 1, but I can be there at 9 or 10 or something like that. Then come on in, and, and you'll be right here, and I'll let you take it, okay? But you'll need to be here on campus for your oral, I mean, for your final. Damn, I keep saying that. The oral will definitely be virtual. So tomorrow, when it's, if you have to clock in at 1 o'clock for your oral, then, you know, clock in a little early, like, you know, 1255. Go ahead and go to that module click oral exam and it's going to lead you to the link. Okay, that link is going to take you right to the third um to the uh 
instructor that's going to be doing your oral for you. Once you're done with that, they'll give me the results. I'll put it in your grade. Please don't ask me what your final grade is as soon as you're done with your oral, okay? Because I got to do everybody's. I can't go to the tell you yours, tell you yours. I can't do all of that, okay? Just give me to the end of that day, okay? The end of that, not the end of the day, but you know, give me to, because I'm going to be doing the lecture for you to finish out the recording for and for the review for the final. Then when I get to what, done with that, they'll give me all of my grades that I need from you guys. And I will put them in the system. And then I will let you know. I may even email it to you. Say, hey, you have a such and such and such at this point. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> but if you're here on campus and you take it and, you know, you see me and I make and play with a few numbers, but I can't do all these playing with numbers online, you know, on email. You email, what if I make this? What if I make that? That's too much. I'm not doing all that back and forth. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what you have once I have all the grades done. When everybody takes their last person takes their oral, I'm going to put all those oral grades into the system and then it will be available. I'll send an announcement and say, okay, your grades are updated at this point. If you want to know, you can email me. You email, okay, I want no mine and I'll tell you yours. I'm not going to tell you. Now that means you got to make this on CPR. You got to make this on the final. I'm not doing all of that. I'm just going to give you your grade as of now. We've already done the plan with the numbers. Okay. All right. Let's continue on with what we left off, acid-base chemistry. Slide show. All right. We talked about oxygen carried two ways, either dissolved in the plasma or carried on the hemoglobin. Make sure you know those two formulas. Dissolved in the hemoglobin is PaO2 times 0.003. Here it is right here. P little a O2 times 0 0.003. That is how much is dissolved in the plasma in milliliters. You may get an answer and it may, it may say milligrams. It may say millimeters of mercury. You know that the answer must be milliliters or it's wrong. Okay, suffixes are very, unit of measure are very, very important. Okay, uh, remember that carbon dioxide is 20 times more diffusible than oxygen and carbon monoxide is 200 times more diffusible than oxygen. That means that hemoglobin loves CO2 20 times more than oxygen and loves CO, which is carbon monoxide, 200 times more, All right? All right, so then the second way was combined with the hemoglobin, and this is the formula for that. 1.34 times the SAT times the hemoglobin. Remember, the SAT must be in a decimal. If the patient is satting 99%, then that's 0.99 when you factor it in, okay? Those answers are in volumes percent, VOL percent, okay? Not milliliters, but VL, VOL percent. Then we talked about the oxygen hemoglobin curve. Remember everything it does when it goes to the left, everything it does when it shifts to the right, okay? Right releases oxygen, left loves oxygen, right? The left um, loves, right releases. And we said uh, oxygen is on the down low. So if, it's on the, if it goes to the left side, everything's going down, remember? Decrease in the temperature, decrease in CO2, decrease in uh, uh, 2, 3 DPG, right? Decrease in hydrogen ions. Everything decreases. When it shifts to the right, everything goes up, right? An increase in CO2, an increase in uh, 2, 3 DPG, an increase in temperature, right? Those things. And then right down the middle is considered the P50. That is where hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen. And that correlates to a P little a2 of about 27 millimeters of mercury. Okay, the Bohr effect. Talked about the Bohr effect is the effect of hydrogen ions or the CO2 on hemoglobin's love for oxygen. So when CO2 comes around, it drops oxygen. That's the Bohr effect. When CO2 comes around, it tends to release the oxygen because it likes CO2 more, right? That's considered the Bohr effect, right? That's a shift to the left. A 
Wait a minute. Let me look at this. I looked at this. Okay, yeah, that's the bore effect. Now, at the long level, at the you got two different levels. You got a tissue level and a long level. At the long level, uh, you have a shift curve to the left, has an increased infinity for O2, and the pH is increased. That's at the long level, right? Uh, at the tissue level, you have a shift curve to the right, a decreased affinity for O2, pH is decreased, right? Um, so, but don't worry about the whole aspect of the shift. The shift, everything goes on the right, everything on the left. Remember that, that's all you need to remember. When it shifts to the right, it releases oxygen to the tissue, okay? The hemoglobin will release the oxygen to the tissue. When it shifts to the left, it holds it because it loves it, right? It loves, shifts to the left, loves oxygen. So it holds it, right? And so what they're saying is the hemoglobin is going to hold that oxygen, so it's going to be a low oxygen at the tissues because it ain't letting it go, okay? So it kind of just breaks it down in a little more detail, but what you need to know is the left and the right, all right? The Bohr effect is the effect of CO2 on the affinity for oxygen. That's the Bohr effect. <coughs> Now, total O2 content is when you add those two formulas together. Notice, this is the dissolved, this is the combined with hemoglobin. That gives us the total O2 content, which is C little a O2. This answer is also in volumes percent. Hypoxemia. Hypoxemia, we said, is low oxygen in arterial blood. The main cause for hypoxemia is a decrease in your alveolar oxygen tension or pressure, right? Which is the P big A O2, the alveolar equation. If the alveoli, the oxygen in the alveoli is low, then the oxygen in the blood gonna be low because that's where the blood picks it up from, the alveoli. If it's not there to be picked up, it's gonna lead to a low oxygen in the blood. That's hypoxemia, right? Uh, also, alveolar hypoventilation right, can cause that. A decrease in the hemoglobin saturation can cause that. Uh, <clears throat> alveolar hypotension due to VQ mismatch, right, which is shunting. If you have blood there but no ventilation, that's a shunt. So, of course, the blood is going to return to the heart void. It's not going to have oxygen because the alveoli was shunted up. Shunting, shut. Shunting, shut. Remember that. Okay. Now, how does our body respond to hypoxemia? Well, the lungs are going to pick up more breathing and the heart's going to beat a little harder. Right? That's the two responses. The body responds to hypoxemia by breathing faster or pumping harder. Uh, the blood will pump stronger or harder. Right? And we learn later what chemoreceptor does that. Right? We have central chemoreceptors and we have peripherals. But the ones that respond to hypoxemia is the peripheral, right? Peripheral PO2, peripheral PO2. Central is response to the CO2, okay? Now, how many types of hypoxia do we have? Well, we have hypoxemic, which is simply a low PaO2. Anemic hypoxia is when the hemoglobin is a problem, either because it's um, has a low hemoglobin, like blood loss, right? You're on your cycle or something like that, you have a low hemoglobin, or Carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning will be an example of your anemic hypoxemia. Stagnant is when it's not moving, so it's also on the circulatory, right? The, the, it's, the, it's not perfusing well. And histotoxic is cyanide poisoning. Okay? All right, again, we said that we know that hemoglobin has 200 times more love for carbon monoxide than oxygen. And that's bad because that can kill us. But there is a normal amount of carbon monoxide that's on the blood. That's normal, right? That's called a carboxyhemoglobin, right? It should be 0.5% because we live in a world full of carbon, right? And now in this industrialized country where there's a lot of uh, fossil fuels being burned, a lot of exhaust from cars. So our carboxyhemoglobin normally should be about 0.5 to 1%. All right, but if we smoke cigarettes, that increases to about five to 
And then if it gets to 40 to 60%, remember it can cause death, All right? So that would be our anemic hypoxemia issue, right? Anemic, when it's a hemoglobin problem, it's anemic, right? And if carbon monoxide is on deck, hemoglobin won't hold nothing but carbon monoxide. So that's a hemoglobin problem, you got a problem, okay? Stagnant or circulatory, when the heart just can't pump the blood like it used to. So you have a low cardiac output. C dot, O dot is cardiac output. And then histotoxic, of course, all the cells in the body are unable to use oxygen because of cyanide poisoning, right? So in a, as a result, if we don't have oxygen, we start to metabolize using carbon dioxide. And that's called anaerobic metabolism, which produces lactic acid. That lactic acid can send you into septic shock, okay? All right, <clears throat> now, when we talk about the amount of oxygen in the alveoli compared to the amount of oxygen in the artery, in the artery, there's a little gap there. Should be small, but there is one. It's called the AA gradient, right? The AA gradient, where there's a little bit difference, but it should not be a lot different, right? It should not be a lot different. Now, the AA gradient is the measure of pressure difference between the alveoli and the arterial blood. In normal lungs, O2 is readily transferred. If you've got healthy lungs, the oxygen should leave the alveoli and go straight into the capillary with just a small amount of difference, right? If you've got healthy lungs. But if you have a diseased lung like COPD or any other kind of disease, like we learned interstitial lung disease, ARDS, right? Pneumonia, uh, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, all these different lung diseases can cause the AA gradient to be larger, right? That means the amount of oxygen that was in the alveoli, for some reason, it didn't get to the, uh, to the artery, right? To the capillary. Something's wrong with that because of diffusion defects, okay? And so that way, the gradient or the gap becomes bigger, right? Remember that? So uh, <clears throat> we can use AA gradient to, to estimate the percent of shunt, by saying if the patient is on an FIL2 of 100% and you do a alveolar air equation on that patient, every 50 millimeter mercury difference in the AA gradient constitutes a 2% shunt, okay? Because the difference is 10 to, I think it's zero, no, zero to 15 millimeters of mercury. That's the normal difference. So in a normal healthy lung, the AA gradient should be anywhere between zero to 15. That's normal. But if it gets up into 40, 50, 60 millimeters of mercury difference, we're dealing with diseased lungs and they are shunting. For some reason, the blood is there, but it's not picking up that oxygen. All right. Now, let's talk about carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also transported in the body, right? It's produced by normal metabolism. Normal metabolism, remember, is the burning of oxygen and glucose, right, the carbohydrates. That gives us our respiratory quotient. That's normal, right? Uh, so <clears throat> that's a normal byproduct of metabolization is carbon dioxide. We make it and we exhale it, right? Now, carbon dioxide is transport. It's gotta get from those tissues to out to the air. So how does it get there? It's gotta be transported up to the lungs to get rid of it. Some of it is dissolved in the plasma, just like oxygen, and that's about 8%. Some of it tra travels as bicarb, which is 80%, and the most way. And then the last bit of it is attached to plasma proteins. Make sure you study the bicarb way. The process is called hydrolysis, right? Hydrolysis of CO2. CO2 adds to water, becomes carbonic acid. And that process is called hydrolysis. That's about 80% of CO2 is transported in this way. So most CO2 is transported as what? By a car, okay? All right, this is just a little, um, kind of like a food for thought. In the red blood cells, it's either dissolved, or uh, it travels as bicarb through a production called hydrolysis of carbon dioxide, right? Uh, and in that process, 
the bicarb diffuses out of the cell, right? It creates an electrical imbalance and then chloride comes in to bring that back to balance. What is that phenomenon called? When bicarb leaves the cell and, and chloride comes back into the cell to bring harmony, that's a phenomenon called the hamburger effect or the hamburger phenomenon, okay? Also known as the chloride shift, okay? Now, <clears throat> We talked about the Bohr effect, and the Bohr effect was the effect of CO2 on oxygen's affinity for uh, the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. Well, Haldane effect is the effect of oxygen on CO2 transport. That's called the Haldane effect. The Haldane effect is known as the effect of oxygen on how CO2 is transported. And they kind of give you a little breakdown that at the lungs, the PO2 is increased. Uh, CO2 is then unloaded off the hemoglobin, right? Because it's coming back to the body full of CO2. It's got to get released. So it's unloaded at the lungs. And at the tissue level, the PO2 is decreased and CO2 is loaded onto the hemoglobin, okay? So once your body has used, you know, it's metabolizing, right? It's walking, talking, eating, lifting, running. As you are metabolizing, CO2 is being made and loaded onto the hemoglobin. Right, so that the hemoglobin can transport it to the lungs so that you can exhale it. So when it gets to the lungs, uh, CO2 is then, uh, the, the, uh, CO2 is then unloaded off the hemoglobin. You got it? At the body, you make up a lot of CO2, it, gum, it jumps onto the hemoglobin, right? Jumps onto the hemoglobin um, and so it comes up to the lungs. When it gets to the lungs, it's offloaded off the hemoglobin so you can blow it out. All right, so don't forget the terms we talk about CO2, guys. We talk about CO2 as so many terms. Hypocapnia, uh, so let's just say CO2, AKA capnia, AKA carbia, right? AKA ventilation, AKA respiratory, AKA uh, <clears throat> acid, right? All of those things are, those names or titles are synonymous with carbon dioxide. All right, now, when we talk about CO2 as being capnia or carbia, if it's hypercapnia or hypercarbia, then it's over 45. CO2 is over 45. If it's normal, what is the normal CO2? Normal CO2 is what? The range. Mm -mm. CO2, 35 to 45. Yeah, practice those because you know them, but it can be twisted up in your head if you don't study them. Henderson Hausebeck, just remember that Henderson Hausebeck is how we find pH, right? It's pK plus the log of bicarb over carbonic acid, okay? Bicarb over carbonic acid is usually 20 to 1, right? So 20 over 1 is 20. So the log of 20 is 1.3, right? So you see it right here? Log of 20 is 1.3. How they found that? It's because bicarb over carbonic acid is usually 20 to one, see that? And if we, and that's kind of rounded off. If we look at um, um, the normal, right? Normal bicarb is 24, right? So that will be 24 and the normal uh, carbonic acid is 1.2. So 24 over 1.2 is what? That's gonna still give you around 20, right? It's, it's real close. And then the log of that is going to give you about 1.3. So that's how they found it. So what you do is pK is always 6.0. And the log of 20 over 1 is always 1.3. So 1.3 plus 6.0, I mean 6.10 is 7.4. That's how they get 7.4 of a normal pH. 6.1 plus 1.3. All right, buffer systems. Buffer systems, the whole purpose of your buffer systems is to maintain pH. When you get too much acid, the body got to try to make some bicarb to, to uh, bring that acid down some, right? Or if you're not, if you're very alkaline, then the body can make less bicarb so that you can become a little more acidic. It's a whole balancing act. 
but the main buffer system is the carbonic acid to bicarb, right? That's about 60% of it right there. Because of the hydrolysis of the CO2 uh, and the bicarb, that is the main buffer system that we have, all right? Hemoglobin buffers at about 30%, and the blood is the rest of it. So it's three buffer systems. The carbonic acid, um, well, let's say the, the hydrolysis of CO2, which is HCO3 over H2CO3, right? That's the main one. And then the second one is hemoglobin. Third one is the blood. Three buffer systems. All right, ABGs, you guys, I, what can I say? You have to practice your ABGs. Here go the ranges here. pH 7.4. The range is 7.35 to 7.45. I don't know how they got shut over here, but it should have been over here. CO2, absolute is 40. Range 35 to 45. PO2, 100. Range is 80 to 100. Bicarb, 24. Range is 22 to 26. You have to know what is what. You got to remember that bicarb is a base. It is alkaline, okay? And CO2 is an acid, okay? So the more acid you have, you're in acidosis. If you have a little bit low CO2, then it's alkalosis. As far as the bicarb is concerned, if you have a whole lot of it, that's like rollage. You got instead of regular would be one pack. But if you have a high bicarb, that's like you got 30 packs of rollage. You're really, really basic, right? Really, really alkaline. And if you're supposed to have a pack of Rolaids and all you have is a, a fourth of one, then now you're coming into the acidic, okay? So we learned those tricks and trades of how to do your ABGs. Be sure to go back to that lecture and go over those ABGs. Also, there's a video in that lecture that shows that young man on, on YouTube, remember? That shows how to, to formulate the ABGs, compensated or non-compensated or partially compensated. All of those are in there, okay? So go back over that, study that, practice on your own. Don't forget, if everything is acid, then it's a combined acidosis. If everything is alkaline, it's a combined alkalosis. If the pH is alkaline and everything else is acid, that's a lab error. One of the two have to be going the same way as pH, okay? Don't forget about your oxygenation status. Not only is the ABG an acid-base status, but it's also an oxygenation. It's two different things, right? We talked about uh, by, uh, uh, P little AO2 is 80 to 100. Less than 80, you're getting into hypoxemia. So make sure you go over what's mild hypoxemia, what's moderate, and what's severe. Huh? Yeah, so make sure you go over your values. Go over your values for your oxygenation status. Yeah. Go over your values. Uh, you said the mild is less than 80. Yeah, anything less than 80, you're getting into hypoxemia, right? You're starting to be hypoxic. But there's a mild hypoxemia, moderate hypoxemia, and severe. Remember, anything less than 40 millimeters of mercury is severe. And I don't know the, the exacts in my head right now, but it's, it's in your notes about what's mild, what's moderate, and what's severe. Okay. So for instance, if somebody has a P little a O2 of 75, that's going to be mild hypoxemia. I know that's, I at least know that's mild. Uh, if somebody has a P8, P little a O2 of 20, that's less than 40. So that's severe hypoxemia. All right. So be careful with those. Make sure you go over those in detail. Okay. Next, it shows you some acid-base effects. It's kind of confusing if you look at these, if you're not careful. So we, we didn't teach it that way. Uh, we learned the, uh, the best way, the easy way to learn ABGs. Okay? And most of you did very well, but you have to go back and look at those. Look in your reading. Look at your examples, right? Uh, you can look on YouTube or online and say, uh, Sample ABGs quizzes, right? And just it'll just throw ABGs at you and you figure them out. They're all the same. Now, compensation. Don't forget the compensation component. Remember, if the third player is not in normal range, we do have compensation. 
then if you do have compensation, you go back to the pH to see if that compensation was enough to bring pH back into normal range. If it is, then it's fully compensated. If the compensation was not enough to get back to normal range, then it was only partially compensated. I only gave you some of your money, okay? I tried to compensate you, but I didn't compensate you all the way. All right, so make sure you look at those. All right. Remember that the, and that's just the thing. Huh? If it's compensation, yes. Yeah. First thing you do is look at pH. What is pH doing? Okay. Then you try to find out who the second player is. The second player is the one that's going the same way as pH. That's going to be the second player. Right. Once you find out the second player, then that's the type of situation they're in. Okay, either metabolic or respiratory. Then you say, now, is there compensation going on? That's when you look at the third player, right? If the third player is not in normal range, then you, are ha you do have compensation. If it is in normal range, then you do not have compensation, okay? So again, go back to that module, guys. Look at that video that's there. Look at the lecture. It's really laid out really well in that video and in that lecture for you uh, to learn your ABGs. Okay, this is not a time to learn them, this is a time to practice them. Hope you guys have been practicing. All right, and so uh, again, I'm gonna call. When we compensate, either the kidneys are gonna be compensating for the lungs or the lungs will be compensating for the kidney. But remember, it takes up to three days for the kidneys to compensate, right? The lungs can change the situation just like that right? Short term. Uh, if it's a metabolic problem, then the lungs can try to make up for that, right? Uh, really quick, right? But if it's a respiratory problem, it takes the kidneys a little time to compensate, right? It'll take the kidneys a little time, up to three days. Then if neither one of them are working or compensating good enough, we can go with medicine, right? We can go with medicine to either bring up the pH or drop it down. All right, this is that other ABG interpretation, babe. If you like that, you can always take your time and look at that. We didn't learn it that way. Here it is right here for your hypoxemia, right? Right here in the, in the PowerPoint. Mild hypoxemia, 79 to 60. 79 down to 60 is mild hypoxemia. Moderate is 59 to 40. That's moderate hypoxemia. Severe, anything less than 40 was severe. Also, we can look at hypoxemia status or oxygenation status in the O2 content. When we do the total O2 content, we can look at the volumes percent. Mild hypoxemia is 15 to 17 volumes percent, with 18 to 20 being normal, right? Normal oxygen content is 18 to 20 volumes percent. So 15 to 17 is mild. 12 to 14 is moderate, and anything less than 12 would be severe hypoxemia, okay? So it's a couple ways for us to look to see if the patient's not oxygenated. We can look at the PaO2. We can look at the total O2 content. We can look at the SAT on the wall, right, up on the monitor. But what's, what's one way to look at the patient to see if they're hypoxic or not? How they look blue right they turn in blue so there's several ways to know whether your patient is oxygenating or not right all right and that's the uh again that's the uh we can look at it this way right here calculated the total o2 content with these two right here this is the formula and whatever i get if i get uh 17 i'm in mild if it's around 15 i'm moderate anything less than 12 is severe okay all right one last thing about oxygenation. Don't forget, you got mild, moderate, and severe hypoxemia, but that's on room air. If they're not on room air, then we're trying to correct the problem. And if they are not in normal range on room, on a, and they're getting oxygen, then it's not corrected or uncorrected hypoxemia. So for instance, you have a patient on 40% aerosol face mask and their P little a O2 was 70, right? Well, that's 
not mild hypoxemia, that would be uncorrected hypoxemia because you're trying to correct it with oxygen, right? You're giving them oxygen to correct hypoxemia. But when you get an ABG, you see that it's still not corrected because if it doesn't get to 80 to 100, then it's not corrected, right? Uh, if you had a patient whose PaO2 was 60 and then you put them on 40% oxygen, you got another ABG and now it's 85, then you have corrected hypoxemia. Okay, you corrected the problem. Okay, like I told you, it's like spanking your child. You're trying to correct them when you do that. But if you spank your child, he or she does it again, then it's uncorrected. What you did wasn't good enough. It's uncorrected. But if you spanked your child and he didn't do it no more, then you have now corrected that problem. Okay, so don't forget that. <clears throat> Don't forget about the controls of ventilation. Uh, when we ventilate it under the autonomic or involuntary nervous system, we have our chemoreceptors. This is what I need you to remember. Central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors, don't forget, respond to the level of uh, carbon dioxide in the cerebral spinal fluid, right? If that cerebral spinal fluid our, uh, CO2 level is increased, the body will say, hey, you need to breathe some more, right? But if they are a COPD patient or a chronic retainer, right, of CO2, a hypercapnic patient chronically, then they have smoked away their central chemoreceptor and they no longer live off that chemoreceptor, right? <clears throat> They then work off the peripheral chemoreceptor, right? And that responds to being hypoxic. See this? Peripheral PO2. Peripheral the PO2. A low PO2 is hypoxemia. And that is their will to live. They have to be hypoxic or they don't want to breathe, okay? So somebody who is a COPD -er only responds to the peripheral chemoreceptor. And those are the carotid bodies or the aortic bodies, okay? They both deal with hypoxemia. The carotid bodies usually increase the ventilation more and the aortic bodies will deal with ventilation and the heart, okay? Makes the heart beat a little faster and the lungs breathe a little deeper, right? As a response to hypoxemia, okay? Now, the areas where this happens at is the apneustic or the pontine centers. They allow for deep inspiration, right? But we don't want to breathe too deep, right? We don't want to just keep breathing and breathing until we pop. So we have a pneumotastic center that will limit that inspiration, right? But why does, how does it know when to limit it? Well, when it starts to stretch. We have stretch receptors called the Herenbura reflex. So, the apneustic center will say, okay, take you a good old deep yawn, right? Well, then after you start to stretch, the harem bureau reflex says, hey, that's enough stretching. And it sends a signal to the pneumotastic center, which will stop the inspiration or limit that inspiration, okay? Everything's working together. Everything's working together. All right, that's the oxygen. All right, all we have left that I'm going on as far as PowerPoints is concerned are the let's see, aerosol and humidity, O2 therapy. No, no, not today. Aerosol and humidity, uh, O2 therapy, and uh, hyper. We don't have to necessarily do hyperinflation, guys, but we just did that. Hyperinflation, restrictive and instructive. You don't have to really review that one, right? on here because you just did it yesterday, right? We just did it, all right? Uh, but it is in there for you to look at if you want to go back and look at that. So what will be left tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow I will go over aerosol and humidity, O2 therapy. Uh, what else is in I think O2 therapy, aerosol humidity, pharmacology, right? So we'll do pharmacology, aerosol humidity, and O2 therapy on tomorrow. Again, be sure to be studying all of these PowerPoints and everything that you should have been doing. I, I trust that you have been doing. Prepare for your oral exam tomorrow. 20 questions. After that, you can look at
tomorrow's lecture, which will be uh, those three or four things I told you about to round everything off. Okay, can't give you everything in one day, it'll be too much. Uh, but you'll have this to look over for the weekend, right? Today and tomorrow's lecture, you can look at over the weekend to prepare for your final, right? So before you go, let's go over one little, I want to show you something um, in your CPR. I want to show you your CPR, how that's going to roll. Okay. Show you a couple of things. I have a couple of questions about the grading because I have people continuously ask me about different grades and I've already told you what is all in, uh, included in your grade. So let me share my screen. All right, after the final exam, you guys will have this right here called BLS. This is your basic life support system, right? You got a part one, a part two, and a part three. Each one of these will be a video, okay? It'll be parts of the video, all right? And then there will be um, questions that you ask that go with it. There's not, this part is not graded. The only part of BLS that's graded will be exam. BLS exam, that's the only part that's graded, okay? Now, but we had to put some points in here in order to make it be a quiz, all right? That's the only reason these points are right here. It's not a grade. So what you would do is, for instance, you would play, push play. Right. And it's gonna talk a little bit. As it talks, it's gonna ask a couple of questions. Blank is the number one cause of death in the world. She just said it, heart disease, right? You will click it. And then you'll keep listening and you'll answer this question and push next and it's gonna be more video. Guys, this is the BLS video part one. You gotta do part one, part two, and part three before you can take the exam. You have to complete all three parts, okay? Uh, because if you don't, then you just guess because you say, I'm just gonna go to the quiz. And I mean, go to the, the exam. You might do that, you might do well on it, but when you come up here to check off, you're not gonna know it because you just, you just, excuse me, use the book to answer the questions. This video shows you how to do it, helps you practice while watching. If you just, you know, by your hand, you can look at it, see what to do, see how much depth we have to put into the chest, how fast we do the compressions. Um, the proper way to tilt the head and lift the chin. All those things are vital. If you can't do that, you will not be checked off and it's a pass or fail. Okay, so don't play with BLS saying, well, that's just BS, it's open book. I'm just gonna take that and I'm gonna be through. That's not gonna work like that. You have to watch it, okay? So watching that, you'll watch BLS part one. <clears throat> you'll watch BLS part two. Here it is right here. Okay, here we go. BLS part one, do that. BLS part two, BLS part three. Once you're done with all three of those, you take BLS part exam A, right? You have to get at least an 84% on BLS in order to pass it for AHA. They, they won't accept anything less than an 84, okay? If you fail exam A or don't get an 84, you can retake it. All right, but you can't take A again. You'll have to take B, which is a little bit different in the questions. All right, so if you fail exam A, then you can take exam B, right? And then we will take the grade that is the 84 or better. So you can't say, okay, I got an 84 on A. Can I take B to see if I can get better? No, can't do that. As soon as you score 84 or better, that's the one, that's it. So on A, if you score 84 or 86, that's your grade. But if you get less than an 84, then they'll let you take B, okay? And to see what you can get on that. I haven't really, I don't think I've ever had a student to fail both. You should not because the book is open book, guys. All right? But that's how BLS goes. So when you take your BLS on those days, I think the following day or Monday, you'll come in to take your checkoff, okay? So that's BLS, okay? That's BLS. So let me look at this. Give you these days right quick, and then I'm gonna let you go. 
Here's the syllabus here. <clears throat> All right. All the stuff that you have done, you've come a long way. Okay, so oral is this Friday. You're going to come in, take the oral exam. I'll continue to review. You can watch that when you get home overnight all over the weekend. Monday the 28th, you're going to come in, take your final exam on campus. That's the final, right? All right. Tuesday, that's when you start your CPR lessons. You can do them on your own. You don't have to log into uh, to Zoom to do your CPR lessons. You don't have to log in to Zoom to do your CPR lessons. You can do all three lessons the same day if you want, right? But you do lessons one or part one, two, and three, right? See, it says watch CPR video in the Canvas, right? And then you answer the questions along with the videos, okay? Uh, and then Wednesday, you can take one of those exams. If you want to do the exam the same day as you did all part one, two, and three, that's your business. If you want to get up at eight o'clock in the morning on Tuesday and say, look, I'm going to do my CPR today. I'm going to look at part one. I'm going to look at part two. And I'm going to look at part three. And then I'm going to take uh, exam A. Say you get a 90 on it. You're done with CPR until it's time to check off. Okay. Or you can look at the videos on Tuesday and do the test on Wednesday. Doesn't matter. Either one of those days, you don't have to log in to Zoom, okay? You own your own for the CPR lessons, right? You own your own. Now, if you want to come up here, that is the day, the 29th and the 30th. These two days will be for lab makeup. So if you pass the final exam and you pass the class and you still have some labs to make up, you need to be here on the 29th or the 30th to do those labs, okay? You can be here, I, I'm gonna have it set up where you can come from eight to eight to 12, and then one to five or something like that, right? I'm gonna have a day time and an evening time for you to do makeup labs, right? So uh, if you're not sure if you're gonna pass or you're not sure how you feel about the exam, just wait till you take the exam and then come in and make up your labs. Because if you fail the exam and you don't pass the class, then you won't have to make up the, the exam. There's no need. Okay, because you're going to have to do it all over again anyway. You won't need to make up the lab. All right, so if you don't pass 210, you don't have to worry about making up labs, right? You, you, uh, because you know, that if that fails you, that just fails you. All right, because it's very, very heavy. The final exam is very, very heavy. All right, so oral exam Friday, study the weekend. Monday will be the final, right? Tuesday, do your CPR lessons, either Tuesday and Wednesday, and take the exam if you want. That's fine. Or you can do it all on Tuesday. Either one, you have those days allotted for CPR and the exam. Okay? Now, that's Wednesday. Thursday, though, you have to be here to check off CPR. Everybody has to check off CPR here. And it's not going to be several days for CPR lab. Well, I can do it because... Friday is the last day, okay? Friday the 2nd is the last day, okay? So it's possible that Friday, if you couldn't come Thursday, then you might be able to check off some on that Friday, okay? Because it says uh, introduction to clinical experience. Mr. Cleveland is no longer with us. And that, uh, the new lady, Ms. Faulkner, I think her name is, she's not going to do it. So Friday will be an open day, all right? So CPR checkoffs will be Thursday the 1st, and if you can't get here for Thursday the 1st, you have to be here for Friday the 2nd. If you don't do it, you don't go on, all right? So you have plenty of time to make time for these days. The 1st and the 2nd, you must be on campus, either one of those days, to do your CPR. So whatever, whatever you need to do, because today is the 24th, whatever uh, arrangements you need to make, you need to make them because this is the last bit to get you on the 220, okay? And, and then that's going to be it. That is going to be it. Now, that's the syllabus. I'm recording this. So if you didn't understand something, go back to this recording and listen to it again. All right. Now, let me show you the grading rubric, and I'm through. This is the grades because people say, well, I did the blast from the past, or I did something on Canvas. This is what counts. Exam A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. Then the CPR exam is K, right? We don't have, you don't have no grade for the Q&A cards. 
uh, no grade for the lab that's pass or fail, right? Labs is pass or fail. Uh, and then homework and classwork, right? Pass or fail, because I have your percentages in there, okay? Final exam, 16%, and written is 26%. These are your grades. So any other little quiz you did in Canvas, because I told you, we sometimes have to put some points in there just to make it be called a quiz. If you don't put points, it can't call it a quiz. And sometimes we're just trying to quiz you on, see what you've learned or use that for attendance, right? That's it. These here are your grades, which we talked about from day one. It's nothing has changed. This are your, these are your grades that are gonna count for you, okay? All of your exams are 5.17%. Your CPR is 6.3%, oral 16%, and final is 26%. Also, we do not round, okay? If you make a 74.8, you failed the class. And that's something we talked about before the class. That's the policy, it's been the policy, and so there's nothing different. There's not gonna be an exception made just for you. All right, that's the up. Uh, that is the policy, guys. So try to strive above cutthroat lines. Okay, stay above that. Take it serious, because my hands are tied. Once you get there, I'm at a 74.6. I can't go on. No, no. Okay, and so try not to do that. Go ahead and get the 75, 75.01. That's gonna get you here, right? 75 will get you there, but hopefully you're not even close to that, right? So I hope that answers the questions about what is graded and what's not graded, okay? Your homework assignments are also part of that, that grade, right? That's, that's uh, it's pass or fail, but we use it as a percentage for you, okay? And it's our, everybody has 100 for homeworks from day one, unless you didn't do one and you got points taken off for that homework. So it gives you a final grade for your homework, okay? When I go into campus view, which is your Concord, um, when you log in as a student, not the Canvas, but the Concord website, right? I put your grades in there. It's gonna ask me for your total homework percentage. I'm gonna put that there, your oral and your final, and it's gonna calculate a grade, and that's gonna be your final grade. Okay, so good luck to everybody. Uh, you've been doing good. I have trust and hope that everybody's gonna do well on this oral and do well on their final. The final can put you over the, the hump or it can sink you under the ship. Okay, you can be doing 80, 80, 80 all the way through and then get like a 40 or 50 on the final. It will fail you. It's that heavy, okay? So it won't be Mr. McCarthy failed you. It will be you failed you, all right? I, We've been telling you, take this serious. This is respiratory. This is not another one of those programs that's a diploma or a certificate. This is an associate's degree program. It takes a lot of responsibility and a lot of onus and, um, you know, integrity on your part, you the student, okay? We've been very flexible with letting, letting you record. We record the lectures now. We didn't do this last term. We just started recording these lectures for you this term, uh, letting people take tests at different times, right? Making up labs at different times. This is all new to all of us, but we all responsible and you are responsible endly at the end day, at the end of the day for your grade. So now you see what's counted and now you see the days that we're gonna have. It's your responsibility to sign up for those times. So everybody, I think everybody in here now has an oral exam time that's gonna be taking it, right? Everybody should be good on that. Please come on, log in on your time. It's gonna be your responsibility to, to log in on your time. If your time is one o'clock, don't mosey in at 1.15, 1.20, time talking about I'm ready. You need to be ready at one o'clock, fully dressed out, ready to go, okay? Be on time because if they decide not to do it, then you know you don't get a grade for it. <clears throat> Take it serious. Look at your suffixes, your unit of measurements. Your answer might be right and good, but if you got the wrong unit of a measurement, it's wrong. 
okay? That's very important. So I will see you guys tomorrow via lecture, uh, recorded lecture. You come in, do your, do your grade. They will send me, I don't know when they're gonna send me your grades. They'll send it to me either at the end, when they're done with everybody and then send me your grades and then I'll be at home putting your grades in the system. I will let you know via an announcement when your grade has been posted, okay? When that happens, if you wanna know it, then you can email me and say, okay, what's mine? And I will then tell you, but I'm not gonna send everybody out their grade and all of that. You have to inquire about it. Cause some people are so far away from failing that they're not worried about it, okay? And some people are now uh, in an emergency situation when you weren't in an emergency situation all through the program, but now you're in an emergency situation. But your emergency is not nobody else's emergency. Okay, you have to keep that in mind, right? When you get to 220, your tardiness and everything that you, some of you guys have been molding in at certain times and when I feel like it, I log in, that's not gonna work for you in clinicals. When you go to clinicals, if you're not on time, they're going to kick you out of clinicals, okay? That's very important. I'm just trying to be real and straight up with you, okay? They're gonna say, oh, she can't come back here. Not at all. And then you have lost that clinical site and you could possibly make the whole school lose that site if it's, if it's bad enough, okay? Especially St. Francis uh, with Susan Parsons. She is no nonsense, okay? When you get out there in this canvas and in this uh, atmosphere, professionally, you are on your uh, interview and they don't forget faces, they don't forget attitudes, they don't forget that stuff, guys. So be on time be willing to learn, have a good attitude, be neat and clean. You're gonna be, you're gonna get a job. You're gonna get a job, okay? So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, I'll let you know when the grades post and we'll go from there. Have a good day.